What we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. And I'm the regular host, Tony Akiya. Don't forget, don't forget don't what we need what is we not need more medication, medication, but more but education, more education because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello and welcome to Exposé with Tony Akinyemi. This is brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. I'm your regular host, Tony Akinyemi. We're dealing with defeating diabetes naturally. And I'm teaching from the book that my daughter and I co-authored in the year 2019. Defeating Diabetes is the title of the book. It's available on Amazon.com, or you can get it from the Shepherd's Store bookstores, as well as Havila Health Haven Limited. We have looked at two kinds of diabetes, diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus. And then we have started looking at diabetes mellitus more extensively. We closed the last episode looking at 10 different symptoms that may show as signs that a person may be diabetic, uh, that may require that person to go for a test. And so today we want to kick off by looking at different types of screenings available for diabetes, different kinds of tests that a person can carry out in order to screen for diabetes. And then in part two today, We'll be looking at different complications that can develop in an individual if that person is diabetic and doesn't do what is needed to either reverse it or to control it. So let's start with the screening for diabetes. Basically, the most popular tests are of two kinds. There are new testing methods being developed around the world I read the other day that there is a new device now that you can just wear around your wrist, like a wristwatch, and it can actually do your blood sugar reading for you. I haven't seen it before, never used it before, but I read about it. And I know that as technology improves, new testing devices and methods will be developed. All right, but for now, there are two major, two basic testing methods for diabetes. One is blood test, and the other one is urine test. Now for blood tests, there are basically three types of blood tests that are carried out. The first one is the fasting blood sugar. Fasting blood sugar. Uh, that is checking the person's blood sugar before that person eats in the morning. That test has to be done early in the day. After a person ate dinner or supper last night, and the person wakes up this morning, the person hasn't eaten anything, a prick is made on the finger to get a drop of blood and put on a strip and put into the glucometer to check the amount of sugar that is present in that person's blood after fasting overnight, so to speak. That's why it's called fasting blood sugar. If a person hasn't eaten and the time of the day is far gone, maybe it's 12 noon or 2 p.m., even though the person may not have eaten, if you still check the blood sugar of that person, that is no longer fasting blood sugar. Because the moment a person wakes up and begins to go into the day's activities, uh, if the person does not eat, the body has a reservoir, the body has reserves of glucose stored away in parts of the body. Okay, it's called uh, uh, um, glycogen. Glycogen. So glycogen is stored in the liver, it's stored in the muscles. That's like backup. So if a person wakes up, the body is expecting food, food doesn't come. The body will signal 
you know, to the pancreas to release a particular hormone called glucagon. And glucagon will now go to the warehouse and pull out glycogen that has been stored away and convert it back to glucose and dump it into the blood so that the cells of the body will have food to eat, even though the individual has not eaten breakfast. Okay, so if a person has not eaten in the morning and delays till about afternoon, sugar will already be circulating in the blood. So if you take a sample of that person's blood at that time and you conduct a blood test, that is no longer fasting blood sugar because the body has mobilized sugar for energy because the person didn't eat. So fasting blood sugar test has to be done early in the morning, preferably around 8 a.m., latest 9 a.m., to get an accurate reading. The second type of blood test that is carried out is the random blood sugar. Uh, in other words, the person has woken up, the person is already uh, involved in activities in the day, the person probably has eaten breakfast or maybe has even eaten uh, lunch or whatever, and you just take the blood sample of that person randomly during the day and check the amount of sugar floating around in that person's blood. That's random blood sugar. There's a third one that is called postprandial blood sugar. Postprandial means after a meal. Post, after, prandial, a meal. Postprandial, that's after a meal. Maybe one hour after a meal, you want to check the amount of sugar in the person's blood. Two hours after a meal, you want to check the amount of sugar in that person's blood. And then there's a fourth one, which is the latest that has been added to the blood tests. It's called the HbA1c test, hemoglobin A1c test. That is the fourth type of blood sugar test. That one is now regarded as probably a more accurate test of blood sugar in the sense that it does not just measure the amount of sugar in the blood or the amount of glucose in the blood, it measures the amount of damage that glucose has caused to the hemoglobin in the blood. It makes the red blood cells, a percentage of them, to become glycated. In other words, they become like caramel sugar. You know, when you take a cube of sugar, you put it in your frying pan, dry frying pan, put it on fire, it will melt. And then if it cools down, it will harden. Okay, it's kind of caramelized it becomes hardened. So sometimes when there's too much sugar circulating in the blood, it causes the red blood cells to get glycated, to get caramelized, so to speak, to get hardened. So the red blood cells are like discs and they are flexible, they can fold. So they can pass through very narrow, tiny blood capillaries. But when they become glycated, when they become hardened, they can no longer, they lose that flexibility. And that is, they have been damaged, so to speak. So the HbA1c test actually checks what percentage of your red blood cells have been glycated. So it's measured in percentages. We will talk about that later. So those are the different blood tests. The fasting blood sugar test, the random blood sugar test, the postprandial you know, blood sugar test, one hour post meal, two hours post meal, and then the HbA1c test. All right. Now, the device that they use to check blood sugar is referred to as the glucometer. The glucometer. Now, the second type of test is the urine test, urinalysis, where your urine sample is taken and is taken to the lab to be analyzed to see whether there is sugar or glucose in the urine. Okay? That is another test to screen an individual for diabetes because when some people have diabetes, particularly diabetes type 2, they start urinating sugar in their urine. And that is why ants will gather in the toilet, around the toilet bowl, because of the sugar in the urine. Now, let's look at different blood sugar readings. When the tests have been conducted and the result is out, how do you read the results? Now, according to the Mayo Clinic, a fasting blood sugar level that is less than 100 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood is considered normal, anything below 100. Of course, in this part of the world, in Nigeria, it is put at 110 milligrams per deciliter. Between 70 and 100 is considered, I mean, 70 and 110 is considered normal in Nigeria. But the Mayo Clinic says 
it has to be below 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, if you convert that to millimole, that would be, it must be below 5.6 millimole per liter of blood. A fasting blood sugar level from 100 to 125 milligrams per deciliter or 5.6 to 6.9 millimoles per liter is considered pre-diabetes, according to the Mayo Clinic in the US. If it is 126 milligrams per deciliter, that is seven millimoles per liter or higher on two separate tests, then that person is definitively diagnosed as being diabetic. But the American Diabetes Association recommends a fasting blood glucose level of between 70 and 110 milligrams per deciliter. In Nigeria, we use 70 to 110, but the American Diabetes Association says 70 to 130, or 3.9 to 7.2 millimole per liter. And then the postprandial blood sugar level less than 180 milligrams per deciliter or less than 10 millimole per liter is what is considered as normal. Now, so how do you uh, differentiate between the milligram per deciliter measurement and the millimole per liter measurement? And how do you convert from one to the other? The conversion figure is just 18. In other words, if you check your blood sugar and it's like 100 and 10 or 120 milligrams per deciliter, you want to convert it to millimole, you just divide it by 18, that's all. Or if you measured it in millimole and you want to convert it to milligrams per deciliter, you multiply by 18. So you use a factor of 18 for the conversion. So somebody who has 130, or let's say 180 uh, milligrams per deciliter of blood sugar, the person measured it and it's 180 milligrams per deciliter, and you want to convert it to millimole, you simply divide it by 18, and that will be 10 millimole. That's how to convert. You divide by 10 to convert from milligrams to millimole, or you multiply by 10 to convert from millimole to milligram. For those who are not mathematically oriented, that may sound a little bit confusing, but I believe that most people can, can handle that very easily. All right. Now, let's talk about the hemoglobin A1C test for diabetes. Now, for someone who doesn't have diabetes, a normal A1C level can range from anywhere between 4.5 to 6%. In other words, about 4.5% to 6% of the hemoglobin of the red blood cells in that person's body has been glycated. If you remember what I meant by glycation the other time. So someone who has had uncontrolled diabetes for a long time might have an A1C level that is even above 8%. Now, the longer plenty of glucose interacts with your blood, the more red blood cells or hemoglobin in your blood will get glycated. So when you do the HbA1c test, it gives you an idea of the damage that has occurred in the last three months in the blood. In fact, at the time the person tests, the blood sugar may even be low or within the normal range, because the person may have taken a medication that has lowered the blood sugar to the normal range. Maybe the blood sugar is now 80 milligrams per millimole, I mean per deciliter, and it's normal. But when you do the HbA1c, you see that, oh, up to 8% of the person's uh, hemoglobin has already been glycated, which means that in the last 90 days, there has been a lot of sugar in the blood, causing a lot of damage. All right. Now, so when the A1C test is used to diagnose diabetes, an A1C level of 6.5% or higher on two separate tests is what indicates that the person has diabetes. A result that is between 5.7% and 6.4% 6 is considered pre-diabetes, which indicates that the person has a high risk of developing diabetes down the road. Let me go over it again, interpreting the HbA1c test. So when this, you go for your comprehensive medical checkup, just tell the lab to also include the HbA1c diabetes test for you. Now, anyone that has 4.5 to 6 percent HbA1c, that is considered normal. If it is above 8 percent, that person has uncontrolled diabetes, no doubt. 
okay? And if it is 6.5% uh, or higher on two separate tests, if you do one test and it's higher than 6.5, maybe you went for another test a week later and it's now below, you are not considered diabetic. But if you do two separate tests and it confirms that always 6.5% or above, then you are diabetic. And if it's between 5.7 and 6.4%, then you are pre-diabetes. We are going to go on a short break. When I come back, I'll start discussing different diabetic complications that can arise for those with uncontrolled diabetes, or probably even those who are doing all that their doctors have asked them to do, swallowing tablets and pills, but they are not doing any other thing. They too can still develop those complications down the line. It may be delayed, but it will still happen. Okay, that's why I keep telling people that if all you are doing to address your medical condition, whether it is diabetes or hypertension or arthritis or anything, if all you are doing is to simply swallow pills, you are not doing enough. It goes beyond swallowing the pharmaceuticals. Of course, swallowing pills is part of it, but it goes beyond that. If that is the only thing you are doing, you are not doing enough. Don't go away. I'll be back shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to pray at our prayer crusade with Reverend Benga Olo Shoyo coming up on Friday, April 1st to Sunday, April 3rd, 2022. Friday, 6.30 p.m., Saturday, 7 a.m., and Sunday, 9 a.m. Venue is the Shepherd's Block International Church, 18 Sugarless Street, off Mobilaji Bank Anthony Way, at Bulo Onibagbo Bus Stop, Ikaja, Lagos. Mark your calendars and come expectant. You are welcome back. This is Expose brought to you by the Shepherd's Block International Church. I'm sure you agree with me that what we need is not more medication, but more education. For the best prescription is knowledge. To be informed is to be transformed, and to be uninformed is to be deformed. We're dealing with defeating diabetes naturally. And I'm talking today about the different tests that can be carried out to screen an individual for diabetes. And after that, we're going to be talking now about various diabetes-induced health complications that may arise in a person with uncontrolled diabetes, somebody who is not doing anything about it or is doing the wrong things, or probably even doing everything that his or her doctor tells him or her to do but then not doing any other thing outside of swallowing pills and medications. These are the many diabetes-induced health complications that may arise. Number one is diabetic retinopathy. Uh, that is something that affects the retina of the eyes. Untreated diabetes begins to affect the retina of the eyes. It may also lead to various other eye problems such as glaucoma, which is too much pressure in the eyes, or cataracts, which is oxidative damage to the lens of the eyes, or even blindness. Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in the United States of America. Now, the second diabetes-induced health complication that may arise from diabetes that is not properly addressed is called diabetic nephropathy. Of course, when you hear nephro, I've mentioned that before, it refers to the kidney. When you hear Renal, that refers to the kidney as well. So nephropathy is damage to the kidneys that is caused by uncontrolled diabetes. In the United States of America, every single year, it is said that an estimated 80,000 individuals are diagnosed with kidney failure in the USA alone every year due to diabetes. 80,000 people every year diagnosed with kidney failure. And nearly 40% of these cases are the result of diabetes. Okay? The third diabetes-induced health complication that we'll be talking about is peripheral and autonomic neuropathy. When you hear neuro, that refers to the nerves or the nervous system. So peripheral means in the extremities, you know, in the periphery. And then the autonomic nervous system can also be impacted and impaired. 
So a person who is diabetic, who is not doing the right things to address the diabetes may develop peripheral and autonomic neuropathy. That is nerve damage in the limbs in particular, in the hands and in the legs, which typically results in numbness and tingling of the extremities, tingling of the fingers, tingling of the toes, and, and even numbness in internal organs. That's neurological damage caused by diabetes. The fourth complication that can be health complication that can be diabetes induced is sexual dysfunction. In men in particular who are diabetic, impotence is very common. Erectile dysfunction, ED, is very common. The man is not able to gain erection anymore and there's a lot of frustration in the other room. Okay? Uh, ED, I jocularly refer to it sometimes as executive director, <laughs> but it actually means erectile dysfunction. It could be a complication arising from diabetes. Of course, it's not only diabetes that can cause that, even hypertension. And sometimes the medications used to treat hypertension may create erectile dysfunction as, as part of the side effects. Number five, diabetes-induced health complication is limb loss, usually due to serious infections that makes the leg to become gangrenous. So when gangrene develops, this may necessitate limb amputation. I have seen a couple of people who have had either their toes or the big toe or the, the limb itself amputated below the knee, sometimes even above the knee. It all depends on where the wound that refuses to heal and gets infected and the tissue begins to die and all the tissue begins to turn black and it begins to weep. Not bleed now, but weep. Bleeding means blood is coming out, but weeping means that something that is water-like uh, is coming out and is smelling like rotten meat. Okay, When the leg becomes gangrenous, it gets infected, the tissue becomes dead, the muscles die off, and then because there is no more blood circulation reaching that part of the body, and the tissue begins to die and begins to rot. And so it begins to weep and begins to smell terribly. The person doesn't even have feelings there anymore. All right? that is limb loss due to serious infections or gangrene. By the grace of God, I have worked with quite a couple of people with uh, diabetes-induced diabetes gangrene or ulcers, leg ulcers that refuse to heal for years. Sometimes for two years, the leg ulcer just refuses to heal. And many of them have been advised to come for limb amputation. And those of them I have worked with, quite a, a number of them have been able to escape limb amputation because when they did some of the things I recommended to them, their diet change, lifestyle change, some supplements and a few other uh, therapies, alternative therapies, the wounds got healed in weeks and they escaped amputation. I can count about six people or so right now off the top of my head who have escaped amputation. They have been slated for limb amputation, but by the grace of God, they were not eventually amputated because the wound eventually healed. I remember a particular lady right now as I speak, uh, a grandmother, and she, she already had a limb already amputated, and they remained, the second one was now affected, and they were going to amputate the second one as well. And, and the children didn't want that to happen. So they, they, they came across to me and showed me the situation. It was very bad. Even I was a little bit scared, you know, but uh, because they had a lot of faith and I also wanted to work with them, I decided to give it a shot that if it doesn't work, then amputation will be the last resort. But it shouldn't be the first thing to consider at this point. I felt that we should make additional efforts, you know, to save the leg. And so what I did was I told them to go to a surgeon, a medical doctor who is a surgeon, who is uh, a friend of mine, and I said, uh, please help me to scrape off all the dead tissue that I've turned black, you know, scrape it off, clean up that portion, and let it bleed. Instead of weeping, let blood come out, let red flesh show, and then bandage it, and, and then send the person back to me, and I take it off from there. Of course, when the children took her to the surgeon, the surgeon looked at it and said, sorry, in my professional opinion as a surgeon, a world-class surgeon, and I really have a lot of respect for him because he's a very good surgeon. That was why I sent them there in the first place. He said in his own professional opinion that that leg could not be salvaged. It had to be amputated. That was the last solution. 
And so he refused to do what I requested him to do. He told the children that they should not let me, de let me mislead them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> even though the surgeon is my friend. But he told them, don't let Reverend Tony mislead you. This leg cannot be salvaged. It has to be amputated. The children, of course, were devastated with that professional opinion, you know, particularly coming from a world-class, highly respected surgeon. They felt, wow, is this going to be the end anyway? They decided to give it a push. They came back to me and they said, your friend refused to do what you asked him to do and sent us back. And I said, okay, look for somebody else on your own who can do it. And they did. They found somebody who was willing to help them do exactly what I said to do, to remove all the dead tissue, clean it up. And when they did that, I now took it over from there, changed her diet and began to address it with different protocols. And to the glory of God, that leg was salvaged. That leg was saved. They didn't have to amputate it, okay? And that woman lived with the leg for a couple of years, healed before she finally passed on. And the children, until tomorrow, keep talking about it. What a world-class surgeon said could not be done. God did it. Praise God. So limb loss is one of those complications. And by the grace of God, we have seen about six people who were slated for amputation whose limbs have been saved. I just shared the story of one of them with you right now. Okay, the sixth diabetes-induced health complication that can happen is skin sores and diabetic leg ulcers that will not heal. Sores that will develop, that will not heal. I have seen that a lot also, and by the grace of God, within two weeks to six weeks, those leg ulcers get healed up completely when they start doing what they need to do in terms of dietary change, lifestyle adjustments, supplements, and a few other uh, DIY protocols that I will share someday in the future on how to deal with diabetic leg ulcers. The seventh complication is cardiovascular diseases. Diabetes can lead to heart disease and damaged blood vessels. These are cardiovascular conditions. Those who are diabetic are more prone to developing cardiovascular problems. The eighth one is cerebrovascular accidents such as stroke. Diabetes, those who are diabetics, are two to four times more likely to die of a heart attack or suffer a stroke than the regular person. Now, the ninth one is blood vessel diseases. Untreated diabetes can lead to diseases of the large blood vessels or small blood vessels. The large blood vessels are called macrovascular diseases. The ones that affect the large blood vessels are macrovascular diseases. And the ones that affect the small blood vessels are microvascular diseases. Now, macrovascular disease includes heart attacks, strokes, gangrene, and what have you. And these are the most costly complications of diabetes when they happen. And then we have the microvascular disease, which includes damage to the eyes and damage to the kidneys because it's very tiny, tiny blood vessels that feed the eyes and feed the kidneys. And once those blood vessels are damaged by diabetes, the kidneys and the eyes are no longer being well fed. They are not being well nourished. And that would lead to them beginning to fail. So these are the various complications that can happen if a person has diabetes and he does not attend to it properly and readily. And let me reiterate, if all you are doing to treat your diabetes is to simply swallow pills, tablets and capsules, or to give yourself injections every day, you are doing something, but you are not doing enough. You can only delay the complications till a future date, but the complications one of these days will still arise. It's, it's sad to say, but that's the truth. I do not want to deceive you. What I'm saying in effect is that while you are receiving your hospital treatment, it's high time you started looking again also at your diet and your lifestyle. You know, I keep saying it every now and then. Any physician that tells you you can eat whatever you like when you are dealing with a disease, that physician is professionally reckless, professionally irresponsible, and you too are being deceived. So please, if you are diabetic, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to settle down and review your diet, review your lifestyle, and adjust them as necessary. In subsequent episodes, I'll be giving you details of what you need to do. But meantime, I encourage you to get a copy of our book, 
Defeating Diabetes, co-authored by my daughter and me. And that book will open your eyes to many things you need to know to educate yourself because you have to be in charge. You have to be on the driver's seat of your own health journey. You cannot abdicate your responsibility and let somebody else take control of your health for you. All others can come in to support, but you have to take responsibility. That is how it works. Today, we have looked at the various tests that can be conducted to screen an individual of diabetes, and then we have looked at about nine different complications that can arise when an individual has diabetes and is not attending to it appropriately. I pray for you if you are diabetic that God will give you the wisdom as well as the discipline to do the needful so you can get out of it to the glory of God. Once again, I want to thank you for spending your evening with me. It's been Exposé with Tony Akinyemi, brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. And this comes live every Monday on YouTube and Facebook from Lagos, Nigeria at 8 p.m. Nigerian time. Join us. And don't forget to share this video with your friends and family, your colleagues, your neighbors, your relatives, everyone on your contact list. Just click on the share and send it to everybody on your contact list. They will thank you for giving them such valuable life-saving information. I am on a crusade by the grace of God. My team and I, we are on a crusade to make sure we decimate diabetes. And diabetes shouldn't be claiming lives anymore as it's currently doing. It can be prevented. 90% of diabetes can be prevented. Type 2 diabetes can be prevented. And 90% can be reversed. And I pray that if you are currently diabetic, the information we are bringing to you will lead to your total recovery and a total reversal of the condition in your life. God bless you. Have a wonderful week ahead. It's been Exposé with Tony Akiemi. Ladies and gentlemen, get ready to pray at our prayer crusade with Reverend Benga Olo Shoyo coming up on Friday, April 1st to Sunday, April 3rd, 2022. Friday, 6.30 p.m., Saturday, 7 a.m., and Sunday, 9 a.m. Venue is the Shepherd's Block International Church. 18 Sugarless Street, off Mobilaji Bank Anthony Way, Abule Onibagbo Bus Stop, Ikeja, Lagos. Mark your calendars and come expectance.